We stand. The Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 4. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats with him were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, or maybe we should say, Jesus promised his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. In the context of Mark's gospel, it had been another long day for Jesus, as so many of them were. And if it, if, if it was a long day for Jesus, then it was also a long day for his disciples who traveled with him. So when Jesus said, let us go across to the other side, the disciples, who had probably already had enough for one day, could only say, fine, let's go. And Mark adds uh, this little detail that they took Jesus to the next stop just as he was. Now, I, I'm not really sure what, what that's all about, but it at least means uh, that they didn't take Jesus back to the hotel uh, to freshen up and have some dinner before uh, setting sail. Uh, this may be Mark's way of explaining why, uh, shortly after they departed, Jesus grabs a cushion and laid his head down on it, and before you know it, he's asleep. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Now, maybe this wasn't the, uh, the storm of the century, uh, but when it's your boat uh, that is filling with water... It really doesn't matter uh, that there have been worse storms on record, right? It's, it's really not helpful to tell someone in the midst of a crisis, well, it could always be worse. Don't do that. Now, this, is, this story is not just about sailing on a, on a stormy sea. This is about living in a fallen and dangerous world where the unexpected can happen at any moment and where Satan prowls around seeking to devour us. I don't know anyone, no matter how smooth and easy their life appears to be, who hasn't experienced real danger and real disease and real temptation and real sorrows, and real loss. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And rather than interpreting that as comforting, listen, if Jesus isn't worried, then neither am I, because after all, he is God. They interpret it as not caring. Do you not care that we are perishing? Dear friends, make no mistake about it, we are all perishing. We may perish violently in a storm at sea, or in a car crash, or in a deadly fall, or by a gunman. We may perish peacefully and painlessly while we sleep. But we are all perishing. 
Our sin brought death into the world and into our bodies. And no miracle of science or technology, no government legislation or social programs, no righteous deeds or good works can ultimately and eternally protect us. Do you not care that we are perishing? That's what they ask him. And now, I'm not a betting man, but I'd be willing to bet that there was a day uh, when the disciples came to regret that they asked him this question, especially after the resurrection, for example. And what is the answer to the question? Yes, he cares that you are perishing. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and buried, just so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Do you not care that we are perishing? Yes, he cares. And now he gives them a sign of his care uh, in that boat. Now, it's, it's not the final sign or, or the definitive sign. His cross and empty tomb are the sign of signs in which we know he cares that we are perishing. But here in this boat, he, he gives them uh, an appetizer before the main course, you could say. And then our text says, and then he awoke. That's resurrection language. And actually, it, it's the same word as in, and he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. From a great storm to immediately a great calm. That's a pretty good picture of the transition from this life in a fallen, dangerous, and devil-filled world to the eternal life that Christ has won for us. A great calm. And all by the power of His Word. And God said, and it was so, it was as though the wind and the sea recognized the voice of its Creator and repented of the evil it was doing. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Did you think that I, I didn't care? Did you think that I would, would let you perish? And with those words, Jesus goes from being the example of faith to the object of faith. In him, we see what genuine faith is looks like. And in him we receive the goal of faith. What follows is even stranger than what preceded. Now the sea is calm. But now an even more violent storm erupts within them and they were filled with great fear. That just, every time I read this story, that just seems strange to me. Uh, I don't know, I would expect to hear and, and they were filled with great peace and they, they broke out the bubbly and toasted Jesus. They go from a great storm to a great calm to great fear. The truth is Jesus knows the reality that the disciples still don't understand. He is no ordinary man resting in the midst of the storm. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, the, the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God through whom, all, through whom all things were made. And Jesus also knows that this is no ordinary storm. This terrifying typhoon is intended to tear Jesus away from his intended path. In the context, again, of, of Matthew, Jesus is heading over to the other side, uh, to the dominion of the devil, the territory of the Gentiles, pagan worshipers of false gods. And there, as, Matthew, as Mark's gospel continues, Jesus will time and again lay waste to Satan's plans as he heals and teaches and preaches the good news unto salvation. Rising Jesus in the boat, who laid the foundation of the earth, who determined its measurements, who stretched the line upon it, who laid its cornerstone, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, who made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band, 
and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. That one now rebukes the wind and the sea. Peace, be still. And literally, in Greek, it's, it's actually a, a pretty sharp rebuke. Uh, it, it could be literally translated, shut up, stop. Remember that when Jesus rebukes something, it has a cosmic effect. Jesus rebukes demons, right? He rebukes diseases, and both of these are tools of the tempter. Now he does the same here to the, to the chaotic ocean. Shut up and be still. Stop. So Jesus, the word of God, with but a few words, silences the forces of the world and even Satan. Jesus, with but a few words, muzzles the forces of the one who twists truth into words of deceit and, and steals the strength uh, and still steals the strength to bend creation in order to break believers. Now what follows next are words which would cause me uh, to curl up on a cushion in shame. Uh, having defeated the storm and even Satan, Jesus turns to the disciples and says in no uncertain terms, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Here, I don't think we should sugarcoat it, Jesus is calling them out as cowards, unable to face the foe who in a short time will attack the disciples with weapons that will make this storm look silly. It is at this moment that we find ourselves in good company with those disciples. Are we not the same? Are we not also at times lacking faith? Do we not also find ourselves questioning if the Lord cares that we are perishing? Do we not wonder why Jesus seems to be asleep at the wheel when our lives seem to, seem to hit the rocks and the waves of woe threaten to sink us? Beloved in the Lord, this Jesus, who laid the foundation of the world, who set up limits for the sea, who calmed the storm, has already conquered all of your fears. For this battle on the sea is but a precursor to the glorious victory of the cross and the empty tomb. Just as Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, just as he silences Satan on the boat, on the cross, Jesus again muzzles Satan with simple yet powerful words, it is finished. Be silent, Satan. Go away. This Jesus, whom even the wind and the sea obey, has defeated demonic forces. He has overcome diseases. He has conquered sorrow. Even if the woes of this world drag us under, we already know that on the last day Christ will return and cast his net to gather his people unto himself. And for this reason, we need not to be cowards. Dear friends, don't miss the promise and proclamation that the disciples missed at the very beginning of this story. What did Jesus say? Let us go across to the other side. Their final destination, safely on shore, had already been secured by the word and promise of Christ. It was already done before they even set sail. Why were they so afraid? Because they did not find refuge in the word and promise and who commands the wind and the sea and the forces of this world that wish to destroy us. Through word and promise, through the word of promise of Christ, your eternal destination was secured in the calming waters of the baptismal font. From a, from a great storm of sin to, to the great calm of forgiveness to great joy and peace. You are kept safe, safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church. Christ crossed over from death to life. The of the cross turns into the peace and calm of the risen Christ. And what does he say amongst his, his scared disciples in the upper room? Peace be with you. Dear friends, at times in our lives, it may seem like Jesus is asleep on a cushion, 
and does not care what we are going through. But we so easily forget his promises. And we so easily forget that when Jesus sleeps, he's doing it for our good. Christ's three-day sleep of death was for us. Three days, the three days in the tomb, may have looked like he was doing nothing, right? But he truly was doing it for our eternal salvation. Jesus has truly shut up Satan. He has shut up the grave for you. And when the storm of life is over, rest in the one who calms the wind and wave and brings you across from death to life to the other side to the Father's eternal kingdom. In Jesus' most holy name, amen.